Record. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alberto Ruiz. I work for the desktop ish team at Red Hat. Um, and uh, for the last year and a half, my focus has been working on Fleet Commander. Um, so, I'm going to try to explain what Fleet Commander is and isn't. Um, our focus is to provide large scale configuration management for user sessions in a non intrusive way. Uh, so, you can think of it almost as Ansible for the desktop. Uh, so, a lot of people have asked me, so can you use Ansible? Why, why wouldn't you use Ansible? And the answer lies in how desktop applications work and how we actually manage the user data in, in Linux. Um, for, first of all, like if you have an organization with 100,000 people, a bunch of them maybe on the road or working from home, you don't necessarily have an SSH port to get to <laughs> and bring your data in and run commands in. And on top of that, uh, this desktop configuration is uh, usually stored in the home directory, and you don't want to enter in the home directory of every user, maybe while they're even running their software. So Ansible doesn't quite fit the model of user sessions, user desktop user sessions. Uh, so we had to come up with something slightly different. So uh, our design principle is that you store all the profile data centrally, and each host will pull the data from that central repository. Uh, and it will somewhat compile it down to something that the apps can can find and use. Uh, so we're working with the app streams uh, to to make sure that at least the most common set of applications actually do work with our system. Um, so to give you a bit of history and background. Uh, Every time we go out there and we try to get Linux in big enterprise or even small size companies with maybe 10, 15 um, computers, uh, the one question we get asked is, well, do you have a counterpart to Microsoft Active Directory? And Microsoft Active Directory is basically a bundle. It's a counterpart to free IPA in our world, and it's basically a bundle. Why, why do you laugh? I like this comparison. Yeah. The other way around. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if, if you come from the Linux world, that's your route to. Uh, so basically, uh, it's it's a combination of two <coughs> things. So it's a bunch of administration tools, an LDAP server, and a bunch of other stuff. So the way our the use case Fleet Commander is trying to cover, the way the Microsoft guys do it, is they have this huge directory of hierarchy of. Uh, settings and keys for different things in mostly Microsoft apps, but uh, some other apps might provide their own templates, but basically Microsoft developers and ISVs have to provide their own templates to manage this thing here, which is cumbersome and a bit counterintuitive. Uh, but it, it, the end result is like, this is way better than the experience in Linux so far where you basically have to write your own RPMs, shell scripts, uh, even sometimes like patch stuff so that you can you have some sort of interface to, to boost stuff there. But right now, when a sysadmin that is used to these kind of tools to get the scale that they need, uh, there hasn't been a compelling answer to them. Um, there has been a few attempts. Um, <laughs> Funny thing, 10 years ago, I got hired by Sun Micro, by Sun Micro, Sun Micro Systems to open source a project called APOC. And APOC basically did the same thing that Fleet Commander did, but it was quite focused on uh, Solaris, on the Solaris desktop. Um, and it, it was developed as a closed source app. My job was to open source it, but there were a bunch of, it was a Java web app, and it had a bunch of dependencies on things that were never open source, so the project unfortunately died and couldn't live on. But we did open source a lot of, a lot of the stuff, and uh, the design principles around it actually live on in Fleet Commander. And the other attempt that was done also about 
think, 10-ish years ago by uh, Alex Larson, uh, uh, already at Red Hat, uh, was called Savayun. And Savayun solved the other end of the problem. So instead of using these handwritten templates, it created a, a next nest session with a special user. And you could open your apps and change your configuration, and it will read the configuration, and you will get a log of the configuration, select what you wanted, and bundle everything to a profile. The one thing that Savion never quite solved was the, uh, uh, the deployment uh, um, story. So they did some work to make it work with LDAP somehow, so bundling the uh, Savion profile into an LDAP repository, but it was so hand it was all a bunch of commands that you have to add, and things didn't quite work as smoothly as a, as a demanding sysadmin will, will, will want. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the architecture. Basically, the uh, main component of Fleet Commander is its admin interface, and it runs on top of Cockpit. It's a Cockpit plugin. Uh, so we get all, all the stuff that's done for free, like uh, Diva access, um, authentication using the local username and password. Um, so we get rid of all the, all the overhead of having to run your own infrastructure to do like a web service in your machine. Um, uh, plus it gives us a lot of access to a lot of knowledge from the cockpit team who are probably more willing to help us given that we're, we're using their stuff. Uh, so that's been that's been great. Um, so one thing that we do on our admin interface, and I, I'll show you later with, with a few screenshots on the demo, uh, is we reuse this concept of uh, from Sabayon, where you have this virtual uh, session where you actually configure your app live instead of creating a template for every app. Um, and so to do that, we need a VM. Uh, and we connect to that VM remotely using Spice on the browser using the HTML5 JavaScript implementation. So that means you can access remotely to the session without having to install any plugins or extensions in your browser um, and from any OS. Um, so so in the, the from any OS part is important because we're trying to target sysadmins that might get a call at 3 a.m. in the morning to redeploy a new configuration somewhere else in the world, uh, and they might not have access to a Linux system. So enforcing a Linux native app into the whole mix, it will be quite unreasonable um, with regards to the kind of uh, target use cases we're trying to, to satisfy. Um, so that's why we use Libbert. Um, uh, so basically, you can select a template VM with, with the OS. And the way it works, you just create a VM in boxes, and we access your Libbird session, user session, with the same username, and, and it'll just show up the machines that you have available. You select one. It creates a, a volatile session, a temporary session that doesn't write any data on disk. <coughs> so you can do anything with it, and next time, it'll be back to what it was. Because um, otherwise, if you keep stacking configuration changes after a while, you're going to have a mess of a desktop. Um, so it's quite hard to predict how to do things. Um, so once your, once your settings have been selected, uh, we put everything on static files, JSON files, on, on a static HTTP server. Right now, um, on, on the next release, we, we have our own server using libsoup, and you, but you could also take the same directory and serve it using Apache or whatever else. Um, we initially, I thought that you, I thought that using LDAP might be a good idea, but after a few conversations with uh, Alexander Bokovoy from from the identity management team, uh, it seemed like using static HTTP or HTTP even uh, was a better idea. And these days, most sysadmins know how to run an HTTP server at scale within their own organization. So it's. Um, we're not close to thinking about other deployment methods, but this seems quite sensible. Can I clear? Can I ask for a clarification by HTTP? Do you mean HTTPS? It, it, up, up to the sysadmin. Because if you don't have HTTPS, then you have a you have a man in the middle attack. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, ideally, you wouldn't run this outside of your 
network. Even in your network, though, if a certain configuration gives you a, an advantage, you may yeah. be able to inject a profile that the user doesn't have in order to get around something. Right, but remember, this runs within cockpit, and cockpit by default is protected by HTTP. Yes. So you could run the static part within the cockpit as well. The so HTTP server is not the one in cockpit. You can. Oh, yeah, we, we, we could. Yeah. You, you could do the uh, yeah. path within cockpit that essentially represents this data. Yeah. So right right now, so by default it will do HTTP, but this is the default version is not supposed to go on the production. So it's a, it's a lib sub server. It's not meant to be used at scale. I would and definitely put clear documentation in that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. HTTPS is so, strongly suggested. So at the moment, we're still in a quite fast-paced yeah. development phase. And I'm more worried about getting the word out there and getting yeah. knowledge about the project. And I mean, I do worry about those things. And we do. We there's a few things I'm not comfortable about how we handle certain things with regards to security. So certainly, security overall is a big concern. And how we want to isolate. Um, eventually, I will want to isolate configuration data by so at least by domains or, or in some way, so that not every configuration key is available to everyone. Uh, but that's a that's the kind of fine tuning that would be easier to do once the core of the uh, architecture is is more settled. So I don't because otherwise we're going to be in the middle of the term. But I, I do. I so have I just wanted to bring up that. Point. No, no, no. It's 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 a good it's a good concern. Um, it, it's a problem that concerns me as well. And you might even want. To, I mean, at some point you might even want to have like a, a root certificate installed, pre-installed in the machines, so that only machines. You know that they have a, a certificate on the on the server side that is trusted by the client is are going to be able to deliver stuff. So there, I do have thoughts on that line, but we haven't got to the point where That's I can worry about that. Now. IP, IP integration will come. Mm. Yeah. Yes, we could do the GSS. You can do the GSS API, and then you actually know mutual authentication on both sides. Right. So um, anyway, so we have this static HTTP S server. Um, and we have a bunch of client clients, and they all talk to the HTTP server. We have free IPA integration being worked on right now, and the idea is that the address for the static server is going to be provided by. So right now you have to put it on the, your configuration file by hand, <coughs> but the idea is that there'll be a configuration key that is going to be the default one. So if, if you install the package and you enroll in a domain, and free IPA provides you with the data to, to give you that server. SSSD will pick it up, put it somewhere, and our client demo will also pick it up and talk to that server. So the idea is that you will, you will manage the entry point to your network will be the free IPA server, right? So, so right now we support um, uh, most of the GNOME stack, so everything based on dconf, we support it. Um, uh, I already talked about the live session, and I'll, I'll show you in the demo right now. Um, provided a serve static, to, uh, uh, static files to HTTP. So again, non-invasive, all the data provided by the profiles with some exceptions, but um, basically they're deployed in slash run in special cases for each uh, vertical app. Uh, like deconf keys are stored in slash run slash deconf slash user ID file, and then the user deconf knows how to read there, and it's, it works in a layered way. So uh, the good thing about this is that you can wipe, you can wipe that data, and everything goes back to normal. So that's what I mean with non-invasive. One of the, our design principles is that as soon as Fleet Commander gets out of the way, everything go, goes back to what it was. So we're not writing onto the home directory of the user. Uh, also, the way it works is you only deploy data in slash run if the user logs in. So if you have a hundred, uh, I don't know, a thousand users, and you have profile data that apply to the thousand of them, uh, you're not gonna create a database for the thousand users on every host. You just we use the the login the signal for a logged in user to build the um, database quite quickly. So by the time he logs in, it's already there. Um, yeah, so we support LibreOffice. Um, um, and GNOME software has a special feature where you can actually add the uh, recommended apps. So this is a nice way for sysadmins to 
kind of encourage their users to um, uh, install certain apps. So once you open GNOME software, this is something they might choose to select, I don't know, uh, even their own internal apps or things like, uh, instead of transmission showing up there, maybe Eclipse or something like that. Uh, that we, we have a special case for that because um, uh, even though it's based on dconf, there's no UI to change that setting from GNOME software itself. So we have a web, a web UI for that. We're working, well, I'll, I'll talk about the future later. Um, so, sir. Do we have uh, Firefox on there as well? No, no, not yet. So Firefox and Chromium are on, on our radar. So there's two things. The, the one we care the most right now is uh, bookmarks. Um, uh, and we were just having a conversation with, the, um, with one of the Chromium developers who's actually here at Flock. And there seems that we're going to have a way to handle bookmarks. Uh, settings, uh, I, uh, I have the gut feeling we're going to be able to do it for Firefox. And the gut feeling comes from the fact that when we did APOC at Sun, there was, a, there was a, an extension that we did internally for Mozilla. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least back then, they had the concept of layered configuration right. uh, providers. Uh, and if we can reuse that is, these days, uh, it'll be slight, I mean, it should be doable, but then we need to figure out whether upstream will accept that or whether we downstream patch it or, so that's an open question. We haven't had the capacity to look into that yet, but it's on our radar, it's one of the top priorities once I get like the core bits of the, of the app ready. So this is mandatory screenshot. So this is the, um, this is cockpit. And the tools of menus is the menu for the uh, plugins. So you select Flip Commander once you log in. Uh, this will only work if you're um, an admin on that host, right? Um, and these are like the profiles listed. So we have one for network, one for G settings, one for LibreOffice. Uh, I'll, I'll make you a demo later and you'll see the whole thing. But this is to give you a, um, an idea. And this is the uh, virtual session running inside the browser. Uh, again, the idea is you, you open your app, you go to the, pro to the settings um, uh, interface, and you tweak your settings. And there's a button up there that says review and submit. So you can review the changes, select the ones you want, and bundle it in your, in your profile. Are there any preset profiles uh, recommended by the you know, Flip team? Or? No. no, no, it's every organization is quiet different so and since it's so easy to create one it's a bit of a yeah I mean plus I will have to think about how does that fit into the UI and whatnot so no we, we don't have anything as of now so demo time so uh, so last last um, last flock um, I tried to do a demo and it crashed it crashed on me. So, <laughs> hello. Ah, there you go. So uh, there's no uh, free bar integration right now? Uh, no, not as of now. We're working on it. So uh, we had a meeting a few months ago. Uh, so we, ha we know how to make it happen. Uh, it's not a lot of work, but the free API guys have been quite busy. And uh, so we, we didn't make it for a little. We, we see if we're able to make it happen for Fedora 25, but this is some rudimentary way. I mean, not from the free IPA UI, but in a way where you can use it from the command, you know, inject the setting from the command line and then SSD, SSSD picking it up or something. You know? There are uh, two ways of integrating here. One of them is if you log in there, then you have this group based profile application, yeah. which means that um, uh, fleet commander needs to know about groups that get right. identified. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's your part of the yeah. And the other one is publishing which fleet commander server applies to which hosts. Yeah. That's on my side. So I made a video of the demo because I didn't want to risk it. Um, so basically, <laughs> I log in into um, uh, the, uh, the cockpit UI, go to the fleet commander plugin. So I, I create a profile. Select the user I want to apply it to. 
Um, so now the profile is created, but it's empty. So I'm gonna add settings through the live session. I select the VM that I want as a template, and the VM will boot. Um, the VM, by the way, needs to have uh, the set the fleet commander logger installed, which is the daemon that runs on your session, listening for any configuration changes. Um, do, do, do. This works with uh, Fedora and uh, CentOS system also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, some, some of the newest features might not work, but in the long run, our, our idea is to put this in rel eventually. Um, the, all the vconf based stuff, like most GNOME apps, will work. Uh, LibreOffice will work uh, in the next rel update, I guess. Um, so, yeah, so the, yeah, our focus is, is rel and CentOS. So yeah, so I select the, um, for example, uh, the uh, single click to open items uh, setting. Uh, so now I can go review the, um, the list of changes. So I have, I have all the changes that have been done to deconf in here. So I select the one I'm interested in. Uh, it's safe. So now that data is in the profile. Uh, so now I, I manually run the client because it, it has a polling interval and I just need to hit it manually. <coughs> so you see that, that Tilos doesn't do like single click because when it does it, there's a, um, uh, an underline on the text. <coughs> um, so it, I wanted to show that I didn't fake it. <coughs> uh, so I run the uh, daemon with the bugging output just for me to, to know what's going on. And now, right, so you see, uh, that underline means that it's single, single click policy for, for opening it, and you can see in, in now, there. Is this behavior read-only for the user? You can select it to be read-only, but we haven't enabled that on the UI, yes. Um, however... See, that's where the min in the middle comes in. Yeah. Well, if you're restricting yeah. user actions <coughs> and someone can inject a, yeah. a, an alternative profile yeah, yeah. that would allow no, them no, to the, they would the, the way the way um, the way the clients talk to the server, that's something I've been concerned about since the beginning. But it's again it's it's like a technical yeah. problem I need the capacity sure, sure, to, sure, sure. to concentrate on. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I've, I've yeah, I like so there's two things that worry me uh, with regards to security. One of them is that like someone being able to inject stuff uh, into the host. It's like, for example, the proxy setting, mm -hmm. if you change the proxy setting, you're gonna get all the, <laughs> all the um, uh, traffic on your own proxy, right? So, <laughs> yeah, we need to be careful. So it, it needs to be well documented. It, it should, at least the UI should try not to let you do the, the wrong thing. But, um, but that's a stage probably not for the next cycle, but the cycle after that one. Uh, that's where I want to focus on browser support and, and security aspects uh, around the app. Um, so what I have a second concern. You said you had two security concerns. Ah, the other one, yeah. So say you're, so I'm gonna demo right now the um, network, network manager support. Um, uh, say you create a network manager profile and you enter a username specific password um, of the sysadmin. Let's say the sysadmin logged in into a VPN user using its own password. I don't want to distribute that password, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I want that to be opt, opt in. Uh, you just need multiple, you need uh, mutual authentication. Yeah, so what I did, uh, what, what I have in place um, is a filter so as of now, I just don't, I, I don't ever distribute a, a, a password that is specific to the user. The password for groups is different because that's actually something you want to deploy because you don't want users having to right. think about two passwords. What, what do you mean, I already, if you know what I mean? But um, so the username and the password is something that can be prompted by Network Manager itself. So that's something I want to get out of the way. But for example, for Wi-Fi, like you might, you might have like a guest Wi-Fi, which you don't care that much about the password of that Wi-Fi because that's something you just want to constrain somehow, but it's not like super secret. So you, you can pre-configure that one. 
So let me show you. Oh, sorry. Let me show you the demo for uh, the network manager stuff. So again, I have a profile. Um, I select the user I want to apply it to. Uh, I go to the live session again. Uh, I select my template and I wait for it to boot. It will take a few seconds, I guess. Um, so yeah, basically, what we've done with the logger, network manager, while you're in a session, it allows you to listen for configuration changes through DBus, and it allows you to inject configuration through DBus as well, uh, as long as your user has the capacity to do that. Um, so we've taken advantage of that interface to listen for configuration changes in uh, network manager. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a profile for Ethernet. Just as an example, uh, Wi-Fi will work as well, but I don't have a Wi-Fi device on the VM uh, as of now. But um, there are ways around that. But uh, this is a special UI for um, Network Manager called NM Connection Editor. And you can use that to add any kind of thing, like a Wi-Fi setting. You can use that one as well. So I have the change logged here with the name of the uh, profile, the Ethernet profile. Uh, I started on my profile, I run the, the uh, oh yeah, I show that I'm not faking it, so if we go to the Ethernet list of profiles, that's what you get. Uh, I run the, the client daemon by hand so that it refreshes the profile data and whatnot, and I go to the preferences, network pane, go to wired settings, and my profile is right there. And actually, if you go inside, you'll see that the uh, the NS setting is what we set on the on the other end. And uh, if the settings are system wide, can you also apply those? Fleet Commander is not meant to be used as a system wide configuration manager. You will use Hans well, you will use Sans or something like that. But in practice, when you have a connection and you don't set, okay. So in Network Manager, when you have a connection configuration blob, there's a setting called um, permissions. And in Fleet Commander, it will, it will always add the permission setting for the user that was logged in. Um, but like you have, a, for example, a certificate for entire org, right? Which needs to be. That's different. Yeah. Um, so there's two options about that. We could choose to bundle the certificate in the profile. That's one of the security concerns I have. I mean, how how risky it is to distribute the certificate through your network. That's something I'm not sure about. But um, uh, but then the the other thing is you could deploy the certificate through RPM and put it in a static place and then choose the because this the the VM you're using it might be exactly the same image that you deploy in the rest of the organization you know so you could choose to have that we could also uh, when we sell, when we check that a certificate has been set we can bundle it on the profile using you know basically encoding it uh, uh, on the JSON uh, file um, and then deploy it on the hard disk on a special path and then mangling the paths. Of, of there, but um, but in principle, Fleet Commander is not meant to be used as a host configuration um, uh, tool. I mean, in principle, <laughs> um, I'm, I mean, I'm, at some point, I might not be against the idea of having because FreeIPA has the concept of hosts, uh, so I'm, I'm not against the idea of also using host host names. Uh, and match those with profiles, but that's something I'm not too. I haven't wrapped my head around that use case right now. So, since since you brought up the question of hosts and users and groups, yeah, um, I saw that there were users and groups there. <coughs> yeah. How is that layered? Uh, ah, do you mean which policy do we use? So right now it's uh, uh, the user has the highest precedence, then groups, then. Is but it a per attribute veto or is it a uh, 
you get whatever is in the highest rank profile. Right now, it's hard coded. Yes. So eventually, I will want to. I will so want two things. I will want for the policy to be configurable, so that you can say user, user. Sorry, group wide profiles have precedence over user profiles. And the other thing I want to do is to add priority levels to each uh, profile, so that. Uh, but what, what I'm saying is like it doesn't mix the profiles. Yet. Uh, not much there. No, 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 no. So the user profile or the group profile, I mean. No, you match that. It matches them. It, it does merging. It does merging. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so there again. So it's hard coded so that it merges them in a specific way right now. But I want to make that optional. So uh, as of right one. now, if you have both the group profile and the user profile specified, yeah, then the the group profile will be applied first, and then the user and then profile. The user one. And anything that's in the user prof profile that overrides yeah. will override. So. Yeah, uh, ish. ish. Um, so right now I don't care about that. Okay. That's so it, whatever it does, it does. Uh, but I do have plans to be able to isolate that and then add, add priority so that you can have a policy where a group profile has, group profiles have precedence over user profiles, but that specific profile right there, you can bump up the, um, the uh, profile priority so therefore, it works in an upper layer, so it, you know, so that yeah. the system has control over that. Okay. We we want to add that, but again, like that's something we, we need to worry about in further cycles. Um, so yeah, I'll go back to the slides. Um, so, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so. There we go. So, future stuff. Um, so the network manager and the free IP integration is something I, I, I'm hoping to have uh, in master soon-ish. So the network manager integration I show you right here is it's I finished it yesterday at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it's something I'm hoping to get for Fedora 25 certainly. Free IPA, uh, we'll see, <laughs> we'll try. Uh, at least something rudimentary, yeah, I think we can make it. But it's up, I mean, to some extent, it's up to the constraints of the VIPA team. Uh, if we can figure out something th that they can sneak in for Fedora 25, then good. And otherwise, we'll wait we, for the next we cycle. We actually thinking to use this as an opportunity to develop an example of plugin to mm. So and run this as a separate plugin, a separate RPM. Install and then get this function. Good. So um, yeah. So the other thing that is being worked on right now is the non online account specific support. That's not finished yet. Um, we we think we can make it for Fedora 25 though. Uh, we've done the fleet commander bits, and now Goa uh, the non online accounts have to do uh, basically the modification so that it reads data from uh, slash run. And it merges the data, and um, and also the way it works is different than it was in when the data is in slash user home. So um, farther down the line, um, I would like to add an inline profile viewers because right right now you add settings, but after that you don't quite know what's in there unless you go to the file and open it. So we want some we want to add something from the browser. Uh, since it's all JSON data, we might even support on inline editing. Like, if you don't want to set up a new thing, but it's, if we add that, it'll be a use at your own risk kind of thing. Because, um, um, uh, yeah, so web browser support. So, there's two things, as I mentioned before. There's uh, the bookmark stuff, which doesn't quite behave like settings. So, we're going to have to, we're, uh, we're going to do a special web UI for bookmarks. Um, and that'll be our first attempt to write code for the browsers. And the next thing we want is see if we can get the same level of support as in DConf and LibreOffice uh, based apps um, uh, for the whole setting uh, matrix of Firefox and Chromium. Um, it's, I think it's doable, but it's, it, it, it's work. And it's uh, it means 
convincing the upstreams to take the code because I don't want to do a, a downstream patch for Firefox and specifically Chromium when most users are going to be using Chrome, I will assume, and even corporations, corporations are going to use Chrome. Uh, and if the support is not there and you need to use your own build of Chromium, that is not the official thing. Richard? This doesn't include web apps. Uh, no. And there's no way we could. Um, mostly because web apps usually store stuff in the, in the cloud or in the sandbox of the, um, what's it called? The uh, local storage. Yeah, the, the, the local storage in, in the JavaScript realm. Um, so that's not something I'm looking into. I mean, we could, but it's like, I mean, the local storage is a key value store. We could, but that'll be a lot of work. And it'll be, I mean, it'll, it'll mean get into risky territory. So that, that might be something for it. For, yeah, to try once we're done and we're happy with the app. And maybe we'll could look into that. Um, it's not a crazy idea. So you're not web apps with apps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, that will that will that will mean that we will need to get support from the web browsers to get data from the local storage into the logger and then injecting that data again. Um, I don't know how hard that will be, and it, it's always different between Firefox and Chromium. And they're going to have security concerns with that. Absolutely, yeah. So, <coughs> um, so yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, and then there are the long tail of apps that don't use dconf and are not mainstream enough for us to concentrate on them. And I'm thinking things like, I don't know, Blender or uh, other apps that might have their own format on disk and they don't have layers at all. Other Actually, desktops? sorry? Other desktops? <sighs> so the problem I, I did, so when dconf was written, I was actually the manager of the developer doing that, Alison Larty. And we did reach out to the KDE and the Qt community to see what they could do. So with Qt, we have better chat, well, a bit of a better relationship. Not sorry, not better relationship. The way Qt provides settings was a better match with DCOMF. But in the case of KDE, they have a, uh, they have a, um, what's it called? A, a some, the notion of backends for configuration, but the mm -hmm. configuration API is built around writing file on disk, hit apply, yeah. write date on disk. So it's gonna be quite hard to support KDE apps um, unless they do some changes on, on, on that configuration API. It's actually gotten worse, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, I, I would love to support the KDE realm of apps and I will look, cause that, we're gonna have users who use them. Yeah even if they use the GNOME desktop or, but um, uh, I need to go one step of that at a time. So it's like, and I have to hit the lowest hanging yeah, fruit. Later. <laughs> so, so that's a later thing. I mean, we, there might be a way to do it. I'll, I'll, even if it's not ideal from a technical point of view, I, I want to make it happen. Uh, but again, that's something I'm going no, to have to worry about later. I mean. mm. uh, but things like XFCE, like they use DCOMF uh, all across and, um, Mate uses dconf, so it's not just you know like you could have a VM using Mate, and it'll just work uh, if you install the right packages. It'll just work. So it's not it's not gnome specific. Obviously, we have a focus on getting the right experience around the gnome slash uh, uh, rel Fedora. Uh, that's our focus right now. That's those are the three projects where we want to make sure we have a great experience. Um, and I'm not against, like, in the long run, like, trying to support a wider set, uh, set of stuff. Uh, the KDE bit worries me because it's a, it's a huge desktop community and they have a lot of apps that uh, even in certain organizations might be critical. Yeah. Uh, so we want to support them, but it's te from a technical point of that view. It makes it easy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, I did try to have a conversation with them on, mm -hmm. around that API, but it wasn't uh, t too fruitful. Um, um, and I don't have the capacity to work on that on my own. Of course, so. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, I'm open to questions, suggestions, feedback.
So it immediately comes to mind for me is distributing the profiles through LDAP attributes using GSS API for mutual authentication. <laughs> Rather than yeah, using yeah. HTTP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Um, we, we I mean, we're, we're talking about a single attribute on the user object, no. a single attribute on the group no, object. It's, it's a different thing. Yeah. So the profile itself is unbound amount of data. Yeah. Right. So the distribution of the profile is what happens over this static web server. Mm. The uh, mapping what profile maps uh, to what hosts is what will be an IP. And that's a single or couple attributes. Well, so I don't buy that. Because, <laughs> sorry, we're both IP developers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we do the same already. I mean, you're talking about a single a string, a single a string, string attribute. attribute. We can bring this up. It's not a single string attribute. Say I want to distribute the certificates. So it's a, it's a base 64 block that I'm going to have right there. Or actually, with with network it's manager, single, single string attribute. If you're just stuffing all the JSON, API. oh yeah, it, it's always strings. It's if always it's a bunch of text. Right, so but you're, you're going to have more. This is more. Well, we already do this. We, there's already multiple yeah. places where we're distributing fairly large chunks of string attributes, and we can stick one string attribute on the user <coughs> object, one string attribute on the group object, and then just distribute all of this stuff through. The problem is that you want to have this uh, profile available like differently on different hosts. Yeah. So, so put it actually, you know, not for the user. But to, to be fair, we did exactly that on the APOC days. So we did distribute the profiles through LDAP. And I remember we were able to do it without adding any schemas or anything. Yeah, I, I, don't, think it, um, I don't think it would be difficult. Mm. It is not difficult. It just will not scale. Consider yeah. organizations with 100,000 yeah. users. And all this data needs to be uh, replicated over all offices because oh. it has to. But it's mostly right once data. Why, why, uh, yeah. why do you want to put it on the user objects then? It makes no sense. Because then you, you get free authentication for mutual authentication well, for this, that user. This is because the case of distributed, you, you don't need to authenticate against some type of server at all. You need to authenticate against the service that is used and it's it's a purely a question of this agent authenticating against the fleet so commander. So, so imagine you want to have a profile where you distribute something that's user specific and you need to authenticate which user is requesting a you profile. You already have this on the client because login D gives you this signal that a session is started. Yeah, but but but, but the actually the way it works the way it works is I pull all the profile data for the network on disk, and then when I log in, I query on disk which things so this is apply. Not a user, really. it is a user. Yeah. Let's talk about this. Yeah, we, we can we can. Yeah. I I will assume that some organizations, some of our customers, are going to ask me that kind of. Uh, I think thing. people are going to want it. Um, and, and I know because in the APOC days, that's what they asked us. But and the nice thing that you get about doing this is that the user has authenticated, or the administrator authenticates, it gets written to the appropriate user object, and then only that user object can read that data. Mm -hmm. So if you have user specific data, that user can't go read everybody else's user's mm -hmm. data as well. So you can put unique things like a per user yeah. password for the Wi Fi. On that. And, yeah. the, and the, um, the amount of writes in here is quite bounded. It's like yeah. every time the admin does something, it's going to be yeah. like one two admins. It's going to be once per user. Probably. So, uh, but we have more questions. Yeah, so sorry, we can we can. I certainly want to talk about this. But uh, so you had a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you do those changes on the fly? Uh, in the example, you use the network manager with data in a server. If uh, if I don't want because now it's slow or something, and I want to change it, but uh, here, those things are not in. Uh, do they have to restart something? Or uh, no. No, no, like, uh, well, so for deconf based settings, we can set a, uh, we mentioned it before, you, you can set an option to make it uh, read only, so that you won't have control over that. Uh, uh, with regards to networking, uh, what we do is we deploy 
if you change the setting and after some time there's a change in the profile from from the fleet commander server it will reapply the setting so you can change it but eventually it'll go back to what the sysadmin said um, but it, I mean we're talking about setups where the sysadmin is in control on that kind of thing if your DNS is slow you're gonna have to talk to your sysadmin if your machine is managed um, I mean we can look into ways for for that to be handled in the network manager specific um, case in the deconf case that's solved because if the um, if the key is not enforced and you've written something it always will read the value that you've written um, and if there's no value written it will pick up the one in the profile and if there's if there's no value in the profile it just read the default value from the schema so so in the deconf case that kind of <coughs> use case is better covered but with network manager is trickier to that do that kind of fine grain. Uh, so in the case of network manager, it will always you will have to fall back on the sysadmin to do the right thing. But you could you could clone that configuration by hand like if so this is this is something that is meant to be used to be deployed in, in environments where most of your users don't know how to configure the network. So if you're savvy enough to configure the network by yourself, you might as well, you know there's, there's another problem mm -hmm. <coughs> that we have the um, applications on Linux, the Mipsy resolver mm -hmm. is written uh, result.com from the once mm -hmm. per process. <coughs> per process, yes. If you change result.com, mm -hmm. the changes are not applied uh, until you restart the process. So if you have network manager running a cache on DNS server locally, yeah. like DNS mask, then the changes you do in the profile will be applied in the DNS mask configuration and it <coughs> will work, but they will not work for uh, other cases. Yeah. Well. And then the other part is also if you have DNS second enabled, mm -hmm. then those changes yeah. will be... Uh, I mean, we just started it's a kind of I, I just yeah I just implemented the basic support I mean this is something that so our main customer is Red Hat's own IT department and they wanted this because like setting up a bunch of the things we have internally it's, <coughs> it's hard and cumbersome for like say uh, a new gay a new guy in um, uh, finance for example I mean their strength is finance not <laughs> networking so they want something that just works um, and so solving that problem first is my focus, eventually doing the fine tuning where we cover the corner cases where things are not exactly, where users or the system think they're losing control over what they want to do. That's something we're gonna have to figure out. And a lot of it will have to be handled by the upstreams. Uh, so if network manager doesn't quite allow what we need, we're gonna have to talk to them and see if there's a way we can match the use case with <coughs> an implementation. So a way for the user to configure his account with some uh, files in it. So basically, using, I don't know, WebDAV or whatever to put the files in the uh, directory. Because it's all about configuration, right? Mm -hmm. right? But uh, in some cases, we want all the partners to have configuration plus some extra files. Yeah, like a desktop background, for example. Um, yeah. So. So my take on this is that, uh, on principle, most times, <coughs> if you want certain content that is not the setting itself to be delivered, deploy an RPM or something like that through another channel. Like, have the image, have all the data that it needs. Um, that, that's on principle, because always, like, each use case is different. And I'm not quite sure what to do in every case. Um, but we, we don't have something right now to deploy content as opposed to the setting values. Um, so you would just go use Ansible to deploy your image to wherever yeah. it is, and then some profiles point to that image and some yes. of them let them do that, it. That's one, that's one option. The, the thing that worries me about Ansible is that what about the users that are behind a NAT? So you, you have a lot of, for example, a company that has 100,000 users, a lot of them work from home behind you have something. You software for that. You so that so then you use an RPM in that case. So yeah. or anything 
yeah. other than the like next GNOME software and yeah. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But th that's something that worries me again, but it's something I, I cannot be worried about that right now. Like I cannot, I cannot get busy on that kind of those kinds of concerns. But that's something that I, I have in mind as we design the thing forward. So, um, so could Vic Commander tell GNOME software to install specific software, or is that an anti goal? It will be. <clears throat> so I'm still recording, but um, <laughs> uh, now basically I don't want to. So that kind of thing is kind of uh, a foreman slash satellite realm, and I'm a bit uh, hesitant to step into, to overlap into what they do. On one hand, for practical reasons, because I don't want to implement everything that these admins want to do. Um, and on the other hand, for more like, from a portfolio point of view, I don't want to have two tools that do the same job. Uh, on the other hand, I do recognize that there's going to be like sysadmins that are focused on desktop related stuff. They're going to get a lot more value with Fleet Commander and they're going to expect certain things to also come with Fleet Commander because they don't want to use another tool just for that one thing. So in, pr in principle, we could have a setting in GNOME software that was called like enforced apps or something like that and then but I'm very, very hesitant to do that kind of thing. From a security perspective, that's right. The ability to, particularly you get you're gonna get some admin who's like, oh HTTP is just fine. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get somebody injecting must install this app that has a security problem. But but if we if we do that it's something that must be in the repositories. We wouldn't we wouldn't Let's say install this that doesn't mean that the software in the repository doesn't have security issues, right? So all I would need to do is the well, you have the UPE tag. I mean, so it kind of relates to the mm -hmm. update policy as well. Like some district, some protocols might be that they want to automatic updates for apps. All right. Um, online. Yeah, I'm not sure. So my my take on these things is I'm gonna try to get this in the hands of real deployments as soon as possible and I'm gonna use that feedback to guide me onto what's important and what not because otherwise I can you know uh, astronaut architect the hell out of everything and then I figure out actually there were a lot more practical things to be focusing on and so yeah the, all these things they sound like something some users might want to do but I, I don't want to guess in on behalf of the real users out there doing real deployments, so I'm gonna I, in in a few weeks I hope to get this in the hand of the IT department of Red Hat, see what they think. Um, now that I'm a bit more confident uh, on the stability of the whole thing, um, uh, and then the next step will be reaching out to existing customers within the Red Hat desktop organization and see what they think as well and I'll, I'll use that feedback to kind of figure out these decisions but it, right now like I don't want to like guess all the possible things that can go wrong uh, I mean with regards to security yes but with regards to the use cases that we don't cover that might be nice to have like I could implement like the whole world and I don't want to do that that's kind of where I'm coming from with regards to that, those kind of things. So I'm trying to bound the amount of work I do. Anything else? Okay, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Oh.